The Tom Woods Show, episode 2346. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. As the academic year winds down, it's time to start thinking about what you're going to do in the fall. And of course, I highly recommend the self-taught K-12 through Ron Paul curriculum. Not only will your kids get the real story about everything, but they'll also learn the kinds of practical things that they won't learn in the traditional school. For instance, how to be an effective public speaker, how to manage money, and how to run your own home business. And of course, when they reach the high school grades, they will be learning Western civilization and U.S. government from old Tom Woods here. But here's the most important thing. If you're going to join, make sure you join through my link, because only through my link do you get $160 worth of free bonuses. My link is ronpaulhomeschool.com. Hey, everybody, Tom Woods here. I had such a great conversation with the great Alan Mosley, who hosts It's Too Late with Alan Mosley, that I decided, what the heck, I'm going to share with you folks. We talked about everything under the sun, including all these crazy nonsense questions at the end about, I mean, I'm not ever entertaining the is a hot dog a sandwich question ever again, but that is one of his favorites. I'll explain the reason it's not a sandwich or a taco is the more clever of you try to claim. It's not enough to say, that it's something between two pieces of bread. I'm sorry, because popular usage has to count for something. It has to count for something. And yet I feel weird saying that because popular usage gets a lot of things wrong. So it can't be everything, but it has to be at least something. For instance, the expression begs the question is misused by 90% of people who say it to the point where now the incorrect meaning of it has become accepted by the dictionaries. You know, like uh, if somebody is absent day after day, it's wrong to say, well, that begs the question, where is he? That's not what begging the question means. That's the popular usage. That makes me crazy. So I don't always appeal to the popular usage, but I do feel like on some level, it has to mean something. And if I say to my kids, listen, we are having sandwiches for lunch. So come on down at noon. And they come down and I have a platter of hot dogs. I guarantee they're all going to say, huh, I thought we were having sandwiches. Okay. So there's that. Nobody ever said, I'm going to a sandwich shop so I can buy a hot dog. Nobody. So that rules it out. That rules it out. So doesn't matter. That is not the point. The point is, boy, this has taken a long time to get going with. Point is, we have a really fun conversation about some serious things. And then at the end, maybe not quite so serious things. So check out Alan at alanmosley.tv. That's Alan, A-L-A-N, Mosley, M-O-S-L-E-Y, alanmosley.tv. He's one of the good guys, and he has a great show. So with that, here we go. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Our guest this evening is making his fourth, fourth or fifth. We got to have a guy who slips me the little notepad to tell me these things so I don't look like an idiot after we've already started. I think it's the fourth appearance on the show. He is a historian. He's a New York Times bestselling author and a podcast host with over 2,300 episodes, which sounds like a lot because it is. I mean, I only have like 261, but Scott Horton has over 6,000. So, I mean, it's kind of all relative, really. He's a public speaker, a marketer, an event planner. I think you should put that on your resume. How about event planner? He's Tom Woods. Tom Woods, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Alan. I am no event planner. I hire event planners for my events. I can't do it. Well, I believe you because I've seen you at events and it's just horror and stress. I hope in the future you're able to enjoy those just a teensy bit. Oh, no, that's why I have the planners is that actually I very much do enjoy them. Okay. In fact, I have discovered a life hack when it comes to the parties I have, which are not very big events like my 2000th episode or anything. But I do have house parties where there are 80 to 100 people over at the house. And for a while, I couldn't enjoy these parties because there'd always have to be toilet paper being replaced and garbage taken out and wine bottles thrown away or whatever it is. Well, then I realized you hire somebody in the neighborhood. You pay them whatever for the whole night. And this person monitors all these things, makes sure there's enough food, enough napkins, enough everything. You don't run out of anything. The garbage isn't overflowing. If people leave empty beer bottles or something, they get thrown away. So not only can I enjoy the party, but by the end of the night, even though I've had 100 people at my house, you have not the slightest hint anyone was ever there. It is the best idea I've ever had in terms of entertaining. Awesome. 
you know, what's funny is that that's a house party for you. That's about how many people are going to come to my annual event this year, but they're not I, coming to my house. Jesus, they're not coming to my house. Look, and Alan, look, if you give me enough notice and it's one of the weeks that I'm free, I would have been very glad to show up and surprise you and attend that. It's just that I'm going to be away the time you're having it. Well, next year, I'll tell you now, unless there's some sort of drastic change, next year, it's probably going to be the first weekend of June, just like it was this year and last year. We used to do it earlier in the year, but you know how weather is in this part of the country that it could be 90 degrees, it could be rainy and 40, and people coming from other parts of the country think that when they come to the South, they're supposed to get a sunny vacation getaway. And so I said, well, in that case, let's do it a little bit later in the year. So we first weekend of June seems to be working out. Yeah, and then you avoid people having snow-related delays too, and stuff like that. So that's a good... exactly. Well, I remember going to somebody's event like four or five years ago, and we had a hurricane-related delay. Oh, I'm not going to comment on that. (laughs) Okay, all right. (laughs) Well, other than that, since we kind of already kicked things off, I haven't seen you in a little while. How's life been since the big 2000? And then I actually think I saw you since then. I think when you were in Nashville, I saw you. Yeah, but I can't even remember. Oh, I was in Nashville. We ended up spending Thanksgiving in Nashville and I passing through, I saw a concert there. It was still in the heart of the COVID time in American history. And so I went to a concert in Nashville for which I was required to neither wear a mask nor to have a COVID test much less the quote-unquote vaccine. Exactly the same concert was taking place in Atlanta, but that venue required it. So I wrote to them and said, well, then I guess I'll go to Nashville, which is exactly what I did. And I'll tell you, Nashville is on my, or Tennessee, let's say, is on my short list of places that I might move to eventually. You know, people retire to Florida. I think I've had my fill of Florida. I will have had it by the time I'm, my last child is out of high school. And then I am prepared to go. It's just too hot here. It's too hot eight months out of the year. It's intolerable. Yeah. And I know you know this, that I've lived here most of my life, but I did spend a few years down in Florida. And it wasn't a huge adjustment because the heat there and the heat here in the middle of summer is exactly the same and the humidity and all that. But the difference is, is that down there, it's like 10 months out of the year and two months where it's mild. Here, it's more like seven and five, something like that. So we do have something that's a reasonable fact. And now it's not winter like you might have had up in Boston, but it's there's a reasonable facsimile of a fall for a few months and then summer the rest of the year here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, we're definitely thinking about it. And do you guys have a state income tax? We do not have a state okay. income tax. That must yeah. be another reason in the back of my mind that I had. Because I think in general, I'm not saying that it would never happen, but it's highly unlikely that I would consider a state with a state income tax. Yeah as a final, I don't want to say final resting place. It's a little grim, but (laughs) where I end up, let's say. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to challenge you here. Now you and I love our Facebook friends. They're our friends, of course. That's why we've connected with them on social media, but by God, they're just wrong on so many damn things. Now, without looking, can you list all the things that our Facebook friends are wrong about? Well, for anybody who doesn't know the joke, I pioneered a free ebook series with the template, your Facebook friends are wrong about blank. And it worked really well because we all know what we're talking about here. Yes, you curate your Facebook friends, but you have your ideological Facebook friends and then you have your Facebook quote unquote friends who are actually family members or people you knew in high school, stuff like that. And those people just never learn, apparently. For some reason, no matter how many educational posts you put out there, these people never learn. And they just stick to the, whatever the opinions that the elites feed them, they just stick to those. So I generated a series of eBooks called Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About X and Y. So I believe I have Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About Healthcare, Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About Guns, Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About Lockdown, and Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About Ukraine. Is there one that I'm missing? I feel like there is one because I I actually looked at your eBooks page on the website, but it's not Bernie Sanders because that was not... I was not in that. Yeah. Yeah. And plus that page, I haven't updated in a while. I I really need a dedicated page with all the eBooks on it. That one doesn't have the latest ones on it. And incidentally, I am considering, it would be sometime down the road, but I am considering your Facebook friends are wrong about gender. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's the one you do right before you move to Tennessee, right there. Yeah, <laughs> although I feel pretty safe in Florida. Okay, on that All right. issue. 
Yeah, I would too. So now the most recent one, your Facebook friends are wrong about Ukraine because that's very fresh as you and I were just discussing coming back on the show. So as a quick aside, in your mind, what makes the list? Like when you're deciding, oh, I can't let this go unanswered. I must put out something in, in longer form than just an individual podcast episode. I'm going to add to my Facebook friends series. What constitutes making that list? And how did Ukraine come up? It has to be an issue that's hot, that everybody's talking about, and generally an issue on which the elites have laid out their position that tens of millions of people just dutifully adopt because whatever the rich and powerful say, they're just going to repeat that. But that a lot of the independent thinkers have a different opinion, but they're not, maybe they don't have all the details they need to defend that position. So it's got to be something hot. It's got to be something where there are clear lines of disagreement that are unmistakable. I mean, I think in a way it's really those. And so the Ukraine one came to me because I thought, well, everybody's been talking about this for a long time, for a year, over a year at this point. Everybody's been talking about it. And if you watch the TV news, you're never going to see more than one opinion on it. They're not going to allow somebody with a dissident view on the air any more than MSNBC would have somebody talking about the Second Amendment on the air. So, for example, the one about the lockdowns did extremely well because everybody was talking about lockdowns at that point because we were all living it. Sure. And again, there was one allowable opinion, which is this is going to keep you safe. And if you're against them, you want to kill people and all that. And I thought that's just got to be answered. So it can't be just it can't be like your Facebook friends are wrong about the Department of the Interior. You know, I mean. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure they are, but that's not something that everybody's thinking about and everybody feels compelled to take a position on and put an emoji on their social media and stuff like that. <laughs> that's really where I want to release the ebooks. I've actually seen the emojis becoming real life, sad to say. In my own area, I live in southern middle Tennessee, and it is, I don't want to get in trouble for saying this, but I, you know what? I grew up in a culture where it was not uncommon to see a Confederate flag. They exist in the world, particularly in this part of the country. And it's weird to me. It's almost surreal to be driving down the street and see vehicles with Confederate flags on them and Ukraine flags. And I'm like, how on earth did this happen? What is your mental process to put that sticker on your truck? I've seen them. Yeah, I don't know what's going on there, honestly. (laughs) I'll take the most unfashionable position of all, and then I'll take Anderson Cooper's position, and I'll just have them side by side. Well, adding to that point, something that I've talked about before, and I don't remember if I've even brought it up with you or on the show before, is I'm sure you recall the sort of pseudo meme internet phenomenon of people saying Epstein didn't kill himself. And I don't want to get into that whole topic because we've got plenty of other stuff. I, am, to talk I have about. nothing to say on it other than yeah. I, I'm suspicious like everybody, but I have no yeah. information on it. Sure. The reason I bring that up is, is that there was a lot of people saying that. There was a lot of people that you wouldn't say are natural allies of us ideologically who were saying, oh, no, there's more to that story than meets the eye. And so they're parroting this statement. And the reason I bring that up is, is that I guess what kind of disappointed me about the whole thing is that you have a high number of people mimicking that phrase, which is a good thing, because if you wipe away the meme of it, it's people saying, I don't trust the official position that CNN is telling me about what happened about this historical event. That's refreshing. But then those same people who will have that in their profile, then were hook, line, and sinker for every major news story that happened since then. And I think it just falls flat for those folks. Those folks, on one hand, say, I don't believe the narrative on this particular story, but they still believe the regime as a whole, if that makes sense. Yeah, and most irritating part of this to me is that I could maybe understand why somebody might immediately rush to defend whatever the elites are putting forward on a given day if we had impressive elites. Sure. If we had elites who were trustworthy and people of accomplishment and dignity and intelligence, people who impressed you in some way. But this is the most unimpressive bunch of people who speak in platitudes, who have no particularly engaging or interesting insights into anything, who have done nothing but lie and repeat propaganda over and over and over again. And this, for some reason, does nothing to make people think, 
maybe these people don't deserve the benefit of the doubt. Maybe these people are not working for my best interests. I don't understand what the possible draw could be to some of the least warm people on earth. I mean, what is appealing about Mitt Romney or Hillary Clinton or Kamala Harris or Joe Biden or for that matter, I mean, I don't think anybody likes Mitch McConnell, but I can think of other John McCain. They all pretended to like John McCain because he was a, for some reason, he was a great statesman. I don't understand the appeal. There's nothing impressive about these people. And it's not like they've done a really terrific job. What have they accomplished in foreign policy? It's been a total fiasco. Trillions and trillions of dollars spent with zero to show for it, and we're worse off than we were before. The 2008 financial crisis did not occur because some bankers made some loans to people for some quick bucks. That crisis brought entire investment banks down. They didn't do that on purpose. They didn't say, oh, we'll really rake in some dough if we extend loans or we buy loans that were extended to people on false pretense. I mean, obviously, they would not do that. That is not the explanation for what happened. But in each case, the regime portrays itself as an innocent bystander who had nothing to do with it, and they were just trying to protect us, but we were too stupid to let them, or whatever it is. I just can't understand how you fall for that every single time and why you would think that the real people we need to go after are the people who don't like Mitt Romney. And by the way, I like to use Mitt Romney because they want to say, oh, I'm, I don't think I really like Mitt Romney that much. I mean, I prefer Hillary, whatever. Yeah, but you know, when the chips are down and Hillary and Mitt are together telling you you shouldn't like RFK and you shouldn't like DeSantis or whatever, the two of them can't kiss and make up fast enough when it comes to a genuine, out, at least somewhat outsider. Well, no, Mitt Romney is a great one to use because he's sort of, in my opinion, he's taken the place of John McCain. And by the place, I mean the token Republican, and I use that term very loosely, the token Republican that the Democrats will use to say, oh, well, even one of your own is, yeah. is stepping out of line because he's going to put principle above party. Because because everyone's for principle above party when they just so happen to agree with what you have to say. And yet some of these people will say, I miss the days when our opponent was George W. Bush because he was at least a decent guy. And you remember those days? And then they'll show you pictures of the Bushes and the Obamas supping together in happy concord. And you think, what in the world? So in other words, what was done to the Iraqis? I mean, I don't know, maybe a million of them dead. Nobody really knows the figure. And millions of internal and external refugees. That's just all, you know, don't dwell on that. Everybody makes mistakes. What kind of person are you? And these are the same people who accuse everyone else on earth of being xenophobic. But of course, they are wonderful lovers of mankind. But yet, if Bush had deliberately killed a million Americans, probably they would say that was a bad thing. And they would not say, I long for the days of George W. Bush. But Iraqis, well, they're not Americans. They're stupid towel heads. They don't count. That's the way they think. At least... I can't imagine any other way you could rationalize saying that George W. Bush was a good guy and if only we could have him back. The people they strongly dislike, whether it's anybody from Trump to Thomas Massey to even Marjorie Taylor Greene, oh, they cannot stand these people. These people are not responsible for a million deaths. But since the million deaths aren't Americans, nobody cares. Nobody cares. We'll take this mass murderer. We long for those days when the establishment got along really well and the Ruling classes got along really well. We didn't have these populist upstarts. I don't understand. I don't understand. It's insane to me. Well, circling back around to the latest ebook on Ukraine, give us the Reader's Digest version of the particular kind of regime narrative on Ukraine that you felt absolutely 100% had to be smashed. And as sort of kind of a caveat along with that, because I know you're a historian, and so these are things that you've kind of made your bread on, is... How much of all of these issues, whether it's Ukraine now, whether it's some of the other books, whether it's you brought up the 2008 crisis, how many of these things can be just boiled down to people think history started five minutes ago? That's On this particular issue, yeah. it just started, like, so with Ukraine, all, all well, issues with Russia and Ukraine started in 2022, of course. Right. And that really is what it boils down to, is the history starts five minutes ago. Of course, we all saw that with 9-11. And you can understand, maybe. The first few weeks after 9-11, nobody wants to hear a history lesson. They should, but they don't. And okay, fair enough. But after the first few weeks, we have to talk. Americans, we have to talk about what just happened here. 
As a matter of fact, just the other night, I was on a long drive, well, longish drive from Orlando to Tampa with my 13-year-old so she could be in a gymnastics competition. And I was so surprised when all of a sudden she said to me, Dad, what was it like to live through 9-11? And I thought, what a smart question to ask. Wow. And so I talked to her about where I was and how I found out about it and, and the immediate aftermath and the uncertainty of the future and all that. But then I enclosed in that a little like Ron Paulian lesson. And I said, you know, someday I'll sit down and I'll give you the whole story. But for now, I think the key thing to bear in mind is I reminded her that it's never morally right to deliberately target innocent people. Doesn't matter how profound your grievances are, that can never, ever be justified. I said, but Ron Paul's point that he tried to make to America was, I'm simply telling you it's a fact that if you intervene in other countries' affairs, you are going to get pushback from that. And that can take very ugly forms. So if you don't want that pushback, you should try to minimize how often you're interfering in the affairs of other countries. And when you put it that way, it doesn't sound treasonous and weird and blame America first or whatever they said about it. It just sounds like common sense. She said, yeah, that makes sense. And I, okay, <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, likewise with Ukraine. Now, the thing is, Scott Horton is an expert on Ukraine. A lot of people are experts on Ukraine. I'm not. But the thing is, if you talk to Scott Horton or you talk to, I mean, anybody, McGregor, anybody about Ukraine, it takes them like an hour to set the stage for what they want to say. And that, I think, is another reason I released the ebook. By the way, it's at wrongaboutukraine.com, this thing we're talking about, wrongaboutukraine.com. That's another ingredient is that it has to be an issue that you can't really get to the heart of it in an article or a blog post or a half-hour podcast conversation. There's just too much information involved, and you would be accused of oversimplifying it if you tried to summarize the situation in a brief conversation. And so this way, I figure I escape that accusation by having an entire ebook. So wrongaboutukraine.com is where we have it. But the gist of it is this. And now you can say that Russia doesn't have any real reason to fear the West or Russia doesn't have any real reason to fear NATO, but it doesn't look that way to a lot of Russians. And one of the key arguments that skeptics of U.S. intervention have made is that for years and years and years, going all the way back to the 1990s, you see major figures in the American foreign policy establishment. So not the Scott Hortons of the world, not counterpunch, not people who would be considered to be on the quote-unquote fringes, but absolutely mainstream figures saying, look, if we continue to expand NATO, eventually this is going to provoke the Russians. Like, this just, is beyond doubt. We have recorded conversations. We have all kinds of records of this, of them saying that this is going to cause a problem. Now, maybe the intentions of the West are entirely benign and are indeed purely defensive because NATO is just a, quote, defensive alliance. But the thing is, this is very subjective. One person's defense looks to another person like offense. And that's one of the difficulties that's faced here, not to mention the Russians feel like the U.S. has intervened in matters very, very close to them repeatedly or NATO, whether it has been indeed the regime in Ukraine in the past or Belarus or the attack on Serbia, which is a Russian ally, and you can go down the line, and Russia comes to the conclusion this is the U.S. and the West is just not going to stop. They're just not going to stop trying to install anti-Russian regimes and pull more and more countries into their orbit. And so there's going to be a pushback. Now, that doesn't mean that you say they're justified to launch this war any more than you would say that you're justified in attacking the Twin Towers. It's exactly the same thing that I told my daughter, that there are things that you simply cannot do no matter how profound your grievance is. The point is, if you do certain things, there will be consequences to those things, as there were on 9-11 and as there are here. And in both cases, the foreign policy establishment tried to separate things the West had been doing from the blowback. Oh, we had nothing to do with why there were grievances in the Middle East. We had nothing to do 
with why people were radicalized in the Middle East. And likewise, nothing we did has anything to do with this Russian response. Well, okay, you can talk and act like that if you want to. But again, that's falling into the history started five minutes ago. So there's a lot of re- – so poor Scott, by the way, is in the middle of <laughs> writing a book on this. I don't know if you heard about this or not. Yeah, he was actually on the show just a couple of weeks ago. Oh, was he? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, so the book is – I don't know if he mentioned this to you, but the book is already well over 700 pages long. And he's still not anywhere near finished. And so it's one of these things where – he doesn't know what to do because he he knows as well as you and I do that for as many people who have told us that the creature from Jekyll Island by G. Edward Griffin about the Federal Reserve is what got them thinking about the Federal Reserve, and that's a huge book, we know that there just aren't that many people who read books like that. And yet he's got to go through this agony of figuring out what stays and what goes. And he says, you know, I have these long block quotes of U.S. officials basically making my point for me over and over and over again. And he said, I cannot cut. He said, I'm like gay married to these block quotations and I just cannot take them out. So in the meantime, you have my smaller treatment of the subject at wrongaboutukraine.com. Well, it's funny that you brought up John McCain earlier, which if it were anybody else, I would have already cut you off for even saying his name. But I will always remember John McCain doing his whole bomb, 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 bomb Iran bit. Remember? Remember that? Yeah. And that's what came to mind just now when you were talking about this and talking about Scott and his quotes. Because when you're trying to make the case to someone else that it's not a matter of what I think, it's a matter of predicting how the Russians would react because how they see aggression, how they see events unfolding around their borders. But in many cases... If you're a Russian, you don't have to wax philosophical about what the Americans could or would do because you have American officials saying things like that on C-SPAN. And I don't know, maybe it's apples and oranges. So if you're an Iranian and you see an American politician that is allegedly a mainstream figure that allegedly has the support of some chunk of the population singing those lyrics on TV, how is one supposed to take that, right? That was an unbelievably barbaric thing of him to do. And yet notice that it did not get him removed from society. No. If he had said an off-color joke or something, they would have piled on it. But he's joking about what obviously would have resulted in tremendous misery to an enormous number of innocent people. But those are the rules of the American regime. That's okay. Nobody's going to hold that against you. You can have all the wild and ridiculous foreign policy positions you like, and nothing's going to be done to you. Let's take a minute to thank our sponsor, Omaha Steaks. Father's Day is here. You got to hurry up and get him a great gift because if you wait too long, it's going to be another pair of socks and another number one dad t-shirt. Dad deserves better than that. And you and I know dads want steaks. Your dad will be the envy of your neighborhood if you get him what he really wants. And that is the dad's favorite gift package from Omaha Steaks. So for a limited time, when you go to omahasteaks.com, enter code WOODS into the search bar, you'll be able to order that dad's favorite gift package for just $99.99. Plus, you'll get eight free Omaha Steaks burgers with your order. Save over 60% on the dad's favorite grill pack, and you will get four bacon-wrapped fillets, four delicious boneless chicken breasts, four boneless pork chops, four gourmet jumbo franks, four made-from-scratch caramel apple tartlets, and an Omaha Steaks seasoning, plus the eight free Omaha Steaks burgers, all for just $99.99. We in the Woods household have been enjoying Omaha Steaks for probably a dozen years. You will love them too. So don't wait. Go to omahasteaks.com, type Woods into the search bar, and order the dad's favorite gift package for Father's Day today. That's omahasteaks.com, keyword Woods. Well, to switch gears a little bit here, I was going to applaud you and say, I'm so excited for you to put out a new piece of content that has absolutely nothing to do with COVID-19. And then I heard the announcement that you're coming out of retirement to write a book about COVID and the pandemic. So tell people a little bit about the forthcoming, I guess this is the first full book since Real Descent right? Yeah, it's been nine years. And it's because everything I want to say, I just say it. I mean, I literally say it on my podcast. I don't write it. I mean, I have my newsletter and stuff, but I say what I want to say now. 
And I haven't felt like I had anything book length in me to add. But I interview a lot of authors and I've interviewed a bunch of people who have written books on COVID and they're all, and they're all excellent. Every single one I've had on, every author I've had on has written an excellent book. But there's something missing from it. By the way, I had considered writing something back in 2021, a book on it, and then I decided not to. But as I've seen the books come out, I realized the thing that's missing. For example, I think Ian Miller's book, Illusion of Control, is maybe the best one I've seen that just summarizes every aspect of the COVID response and just shows whether it was successful or not. And it's really well done. And he followed it very closely, so he has all the information. But the dimension of the story that I'm bringing with this as of now untitled volume is the day by day, almost diary format, reproducing the experience of living through those years. Because, you know, we're going to raise children who were not even alive when this happened, or maybe they were young and they didn't understand what was going on, or there will be generations down the road will all be dead. There'll be no survivors who live through this any longer. And I want this story to be told in a way that reproduces what it was like to go through it every day. Because as much as we may have followed this, I promise you, you have forgotten 75% of the lunacy. I know I have, and I'm a daily chronicler of it. I went back and read some of the things I was writing on a daily basis. And I remember saying to myself, I forgot they did this. I forgot this person said this ridiculous thing. These things that I wrote at that time cannot vanish into the ether because some of these are just smoking guns. So uh, what I want to have it be is in effect almost like a diary format, not every single day because then it would be like a Scott Horton size book, (laughs) but rather I'll pick the juiciest of the days so as to make the book manageable and just have it go in chronological order so that none of this stuff is forgotten. So that all the stuff that was done to us is measured against the bar of justice. And as I said, as I looked over some of the things I've done, the case against what was done with COVID is 10 times more overwhelming than you may think it is now. I mean, it is, this book is going to be a relentless, nonstop demolition. I mean, like nothing you've seen, it is just merciless. And it's got to be done. It's just got to be done. I remember thinking, a lot of people have written books on this. I don't need to do it. But I have this angle, I decided. And I think I've just got to because I've got too much stuff that everybody else forgot or isn't included anywhere else. It's got to go in there. And there's a lot of charts too. Here's what they said would happen. Here's what happened. Here's a chart showing health outcomes. And down here is what the where the timeline should be. Like, here's where we should mark where Christmas and Thanksgiving are because that's when everybody should have died. But okay, if Christmas and Thanksgiving were supposed to be so deadly, you probably don't even need me to put those on the chart, do you? Just point them out to me. You can't because the results for everything were completely random through the whole thing. And that comes through page after relentless page of this thing. And I know there are gonna be some people who are well down the rabbit hole who think that just talking about whether the stuff worked or not is just so primitive. I mean, we need to be talking about who are the real people running the world. And I totally understand that. But I am telling you that there are 100 million Americans at least who don't agree with you, who think you're a crazy lunatic. So I'm afraid the first step to reach those people is to tell them it didn't work. That's step one. It didn't work. Then if you want to say, and by the way, these people are also extremely sinister, I'm completely with you on that. I believe that. But step one is none of the stuff worked. And yet they speak to this day as if it worked. They speak to this. Yeah, nobody liked the lockdowns, but, you know, they saved lives. Says who? Says who? We have scatter plots showing lockdown stringency against health outcomes. The results are entirely random. They're entirely random. There's no connection whatsoever. Now, then the next thing would be to try to figure out why is that? Why would that be? What are some hypotheses to explain why that would be? But we're not even at that stage. We're still at a stage where we have people gaslighting us into thinking that, oh, well, you know, yeah, Applebee's had to go to takeout for a few months, and that was a real shame. But it was a minor inconvenience that didn't really hurt anybody all that much, and it saved a lot of lives. And they just say that as if it's a commonplace that requires no evidence. 
Well, the evidence all runs in the other direction. So yes, it's true. I've written a lot about this and people think it's time to move on. And of course, I, on my podcast, I talk about all different kinds of topics, but this would be like living through World War II and not wanting to talk about it. I mean, I think we have to talk about it. Sure. I mean, and likewise, this, I mean, this led to, I mean, we all know what it led to in terms of the expansion of government power. It teaches us an enormous amount about propaganda, how suggestible people are. It teaches about the public health establishment, about the ambitions these people have for controlling us through vaccine passports and international travel and everything. I don't think you can talk about it too much. And so I feel like this will make me feel better that all the stuff that I wrote as it was happening, I read it and I have to say it's really good. I don't believe in this whole, if you do something really good, you're supposed to go and say, oh, well, you know, my modest contribution, it's not that good. No, I don't believe in that. I wrote some good stuff about this. That's just a fact. It's good. And as I reread it, it's way better than I remember it. It's really good. It really gets them right between the eyes. Well, I think what frustrates a lot of people, the people who are already on the side of this whole thing was a sham, is that you're starting to see, in the same way that everyone today was magically against the war in Iraq, when we all know that they were totally for it 20 years ago, but everyone magically today says, oh, well, I was always against the war in Iraq. You're starting to see that already now. You're starting to see some of the mainstream media will occasionally put out an article saying, oh, well, here's some questionable data on this particular point, or, oh, well, there certainly have been some adverse reactions to this vaccine. Who could have ever guessed that that could possibly happen? And I think that that's what really boils people's blood, because then people are saying, yeah, I know, I said that 16 months ago, and then I lost my job, and I had all my accounts deleted, and my bank shut down my bank account, and I had to withdraw my money, assuming I could get it, depending on where in the world you lived at the time. So I think all of that distills down to people always want there to be consequences for the ruling class's actions. Yeah. But sadly, that almost is never the case. And so perhaps the next best thing is you just lay out the case in the hopes that they don't go down the rabbit hole the next time. It really is incredible that nobody's ever called to account. And it's one of the poisons of nationalism that it makes us feel less empathy for people elsewhere in the world. Now, I'm not saying you have equal empathy for every human being on earth because that's inhuman. Your heart is only so large. I don't have the same care for somebody on the other side of the world as I do for my own child. That I get. But at the same time, I don't just callously disregard a terrible atrocity occurring to somebody else. And yet, for some reason, I think a lot of Americans do because there should be executions taking place in the U.S. of war criminals over what was done to Iraq. I mean, there should be extremely harsh punishments because if this was done, if you killed that many people for what we know you obviously knew was no good reason, and it was in this country, you would be made an example of in the history books, you'd be shunned by everybody, and that would be the end of it. Whereas George W. Bush can hobnob among the elites of the world still to this day and be welcomed and treated with respect and cheered on by people. And if he wants to write an op-ed for the New York Times, they'll happily publish it. It's like it never happened. So nothing happens to him because the people he committed his crimes against lived all the way over there. And if it's all the way over there, then, you know, that doesn't really count. Well, on a related note to that, I saw on Twitter just recently, this might have just been yesterday, Kim.com. I don't know if you're familiar with Kim.com. I saw a video of myself being tweeted yes. by Kim.com. Yes. So he was sharing a clip of one of your talks at Mises where you were taking former President Barack Obama to task on his record because, of course, he's the Nobel Peace Prize president and all this great humanitarian efforts and all the boundaries that he crossed and the ceilings that he broke. And you were going over his more realistic record, ending, of course, with the extrajudicial killings of people and the drone strikes and so on and so forth. And it got me thinking, are we going to see a speech like that for a Trump or a Biden? Oh, you mean from me? Yeah. Uh, well, okay. and, and, I, and by the way, I say that because it was particularly good. You did it at a time where 
you're kind of doing what you're doing right now with COVID is that you have this huge group of people that maybe if they don't have a strong opinion on the subject, it's just that, well, everywhere I hear is that he's a great guy. So right, even if right, I don't right. love him as a president, he's just a great guy, even if he's not a great president. Well, maybe if you have a show notes page or something, you can put that video up. Yes. But what they didn't do, and it was kind of an injustice in introducing the video, is to point out that actually that entire thing that they recorded me saying, I preface that by saying, I want to read to you a lengthy passage written by my friend, Anthony Gregory. So it was actually Anthony Gregory who had written this amazing thing, indicting Obama for all these misdeeds. And I couldn't improve on it. So when I was giving a speech, I said, I'm just going to read to you this bill of particulars from Anthony Gregory. But they didn't put that part in. So it looks like I did all this. And one way you can tell, though, that it's not really my words is that I almost never read anything when I'm giving a speech. But you can tell I'm reading that. Sure. And it's because it was somebody else's words. So, yeah, maybe someday there'll be something like that. But I feel like over the past, I don't remember when I gave those remarks, at least 10 years ago. But over those 10 years, I feel like there have been so many more people who have come along with big platforms, with a lot of knowledge, who are very effective communicators. Like I go on Twitter and I see something outrageous. Then I look at the comments and they're all saying what I would have said. Like, okay, I guess I don't even, I'm not even necessary. I don't, I'm not even needed over here. <laughs> so I feel like, I, yeah, that'll get written, but it'll be spontaneously by 12 people we never heard of. Those are just the libertarian AI bots. They're, They're super aware. Yeah, yeah, very good. They're way better than the real life libertarians half the time. <laughs> what? Whoa, okay. Well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go there. They better uh, habits. Okay. All right. Well, we're running short on time. There's actually so many more things I want to discuss with you, but maybe if you'll indulge me, perhaps come back on later this year. I actually wanted to do a whole bit talking about prognosticating the upcoming presidential cycle, but mm -hmm. we don't have time for that. And I'm and no good at that anyway. It's gonna be a clown show. There you go. There, well, okay, there, well, there that's a good prediction. Yeah. All right. So we've got a five-question lightning round that we're going to try to churn out here. And several of these are questions from my audience. So if any of them particularly are take you aback or offend you, just know that I didn't write it. They did. All right. All right. Question number one. Tom travels a lot. Is there any place that he's been, but he will never, ever go back? Oh, let's see. Yes, but it wasn't a travel destination as much as it was a place I lived. I think it's safe to say I'll never return to Topeka, Kansas. Ooh. It's a soul-crushing place. Yeah, but otherwise, in terms of like the countries I've visited, I've gotten something out of every single one of them. I've really enjoyed them. And you know, I like I've been to Nebraska. I see no reason ever to go back there, but I wouldn't I don't have anything against Nebraska. I wouldn't be hostile toward it, whereas I am hostile toward Kansas. That place crushes your soul and you got to stay away. All right. I know for a fact at least one of our viewers is from Kansas, so take that. <laughs> oh, okay, but you know, and you can say that, look, I say a lot of nasty things about the town I live in because I'm not particularly fond of it, but I'm kind of stuck here until the kids graduate. All right. Number two, ask him what he thinks of chocolate milk. Tom, what do you think of chocolate milk? I love it. I don't drink it enough. I probably drink it once a year. Now, do you mix your own chocolate milk or do I you buy do, some? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, I do. All right. Just make, I'm just making sure. If it's chocolate milk on the shelf, that's no good. You got to mix and it. The, and if anybody wants to follow about whether it's raw milk or not, and I don't, I mean, I don't, it's, okay. it's already too sophisticated for me. All right. We'll get into that when Bolden comes on the show. Okay. Yeah. All right. Number three, have you considered updating and re-releasing any of your previous books or are you 100% content with all of them? My book, The Church and the Market, we added an extra chapter for like a 10th anniversary edition that came out in 2015. And the second edition has a much, much more attractive cover. It has a chapter where I respond to some critics. It has a new introduction. So The Church and the Market does have an updated version. And I was approached, but they haven't responded to me. So I don't know if this is still a go or not. But I was approached about updating as in adding an extra chapter to The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History, because that oh. came out in 2004. Or, yeah, it was 2000, late 2004. So that means, you know, there's nothing in there about, because I didn't get to Bush in that, so there's no 9-11, there's no Afghanistan, there's no Obama, Trump, Obamacare, the 2008 financial crisis, COVID. I mean, it's just 
nothing about any of that. So they said, how about adding one chapter on that? But the chapter can't be any longer than any of your other chapters. And it's going to cover all those topics. I don't see how that can really be done. But if they really want me to do it for like a 20th anniversary edition coming out next year in 2024, maybe I would try and then just include a lot of recommended readings in there to ease my conscience that at least, well, I couldn't fit everything, but I can direct people to the right places. I know you have the timeline correct because I own that book and I had just graduated high school. So. Oh my. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And naturally I knew everything there was to know already at that point in time, but I read it anyway. (laughs) Good for you. All right. All right. Number four, ask him if he likes punk rock. Do you like punk rock? I don't really, but I don't have anything. Like I'm not hostile to it or to people who enjoy it. It just doesn't do anything for me. And in a way, punk rock was a reaction against the pretensions of some of the progressive rock. And they're like, punk rock is going to be aggressively simple and in your face. It's too much those things for me. So it it doesn't really do anything for me. I'm sorry to say. I'm going to hijack his question by saying, how much do you love seeing all these anti-establishment rockers all parroting the regime narrative? Oh, it's just, it's just terrible. It's just terrible. But I've had a chance to get to know. In fact, I totally blew this. I was supposed to get back to them and I haven't yet, but the guys who wrote the song, I'm too sexy, right said Fred. Mm -hmm. I've become friendly with them because of this whole COVID thing because they were great. They were just as good as Eric Clapton or Van Morrison. And I had them on the show once. And then ever since I can direct message them on Twitter and they answer me. You know, I, I said, hey, I got to get you guys back on. Let's talk about your book. And they said, oh, yeah, let's absolutely. Let's do it. So I said, hey, this is kind of a fun life I have now. So, but yeah, in general, I just ignore the political opinions of most musicians. All right. And the last one, this is the finale. If you have, wait, wait. oh, okay. I was going to ask, does it start with an is? No, no, no. Close enough. If you have two lasagnas and you stack one lasagna on top of the other, Is it still two lasagnas, or is it now just simply a lasagna? Okay, well, here is where the Italian language will come in and help us, because in Italian, they say lasagna with an E at the end, lasagna, because each individual layer of pasta is one lasagna. So when you have multiple of them, it becomes lasagna. In the same way that, strictly speaking, If you have a plate of ravioli, if you have one of them, it is a raviolo. Or if you have one strand of spaghetti, it is a spaghetto. And the way you make the plural in Italian with a masculine singular noun is by changing the O to an I becomes spaghetti. So likewise, it would always be lasagnas in the plural because in the strict Italian definition, the lasagna is actually the layers of the pasta. So I can evade your question by appealing to Italian. No, I'm sorry. That's incorrect. I tell you what. So you and Doc Dixon, all right? So Doc Dixon fought me on this by saying that it has some, that magically the top cheese layer is what differentiates. And if there's a cheese layer somewhere in the middle, then it's still two. He refused to accept that it become one. And you invaded the question entirely. How dare you? (laughs) I kind of did evade the question, but... I got to say spaghetto and raviolo on your show. That is true. Well, that's a huge cry from saying, because screw you, that's why, which was your answer to the last time I asked you, movies. <laughs> all right, Tom, where can people go to support you and find all your content? If I were in my marketer mode, I would just send them right to a squeeze page where they enter their email address and get a free ebook. But instead, I will send them to tomwoods.com because right at the top of tomwoods.com, there is an opportunity to get a free ebook, which is my ebook on national divorce. So you can just go to tomwoods.com, opt in there. And that is a great, I'm very proud of that thing. Chapter one of that ebook, you will never look at the United States the same way again. So go over there and enjoy that. Well, Tom, it's been an absolute pleasure. I would love to get you back on a little bit later this year, perhaps. And you let me know if the first weekend of June will work with you. You're the type of person that if we've got to move it a week or whatever, one way or the other, we'll do it. I appreciate that. I'll just make sure this time, now that I know it's the first week in in June, I won't schedule any family trips. It's that we have a family trip to Boston and 
I've already lined up all the kiddos airline tickets and I'm just, I can't change it, but we'll do it another week next year. Well, you can even tell them that kids next year, we're going to go to Columbia, Tennessee, which is the mule capital of the world in the home of former president James K. Polk. How could they possibly say no to that? Absolutely. And, and how far are you from Nashville? Uh, about 40 minutes south of Nashville. So they could also visit the Hermitage. I know yes. they want to see Andrew Jackson's home. Sure. He says sarcastically, but I wish they did. <laughs> All right, Tom, thank you so much for being on the show. This was great. My pleasure. Thank you. All right, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that. I will see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.